I just want to thank everyone for joining us, especially the online community. And I have a really special guest with me today. So I'm going to let him say hello. Hi, everybody. I'm Zach Ward. Nice to meet you. Okay, Zach. So to give a little backstory, when I reached out to Zach, I also did not have a lot that I said about what we were going to talk about outside of mental health. And he was completely up for it. So I definitely give you credit for just taking that open invitation to talk about mental health. But I'm gonna ask you right away, what did you think when that was the first question on that, that I, you knew that was the topic? We're gonna to talk about Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, just interesting timing. I've been going through my own processes uh, for the last few years. My father just died of Alzheimer's on December 19th of 2023. Um, I celebrated my three years of sobriety yesterday, and obviously the entire world has dealt with COVID, and California has dealt with the uh, strike for the last year. So there has been, the last five years have just been brutal, incredibly difficult, incredibly painful, scary, sad, uh, depressing times to be in, and um, it's hard. Uh, and it, it is an active process to get involved in. So I think it's incredibly important because um, the reality is it's the only thing you can control. Okay, so dealing with COVID, I'm sure we all had this experience regardless of whether uh, you were on board or not on board from the beginning is it was very intimidating and scary and the information was scattered and haphazard and confusing. Uh, it was very isolating and I don't know, I live in Los Angeles um, and people here started staying at home and drinking a lot. And it was very interesting to me that um, drinking and driving, which has been illegal for since forever, uh, all of a sudden during COVID, you could go pick up, a, you go to a restaurant and pick up a container of alcohol in an, that's an open container in your vehicle and drive with it, which is normally 100% illegal um qualifies as a DUI so it was really sort of a sponsored statement like alcohol is required to handle the stress and everybody was drinking quite a bit myself included and then it kind of everybody sort of soaked up that reality um and I think it became very isolating, obviously, and depressing because the offset of alcohol is that you just get massively depressed. Um, I was very fortunate during that time. I, I don't have a large house, but my house is large enough that I, have, my wife and I can be in separate parts of it and or go outside and enjoy the backyard and the tree and whatever. And at the same time, I was um, building a house um, and then my father was diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's. So it was, uh, that was all very busy and time consuming. So it's not like I ever had the luxury of being um, bored as I know a lot of people were. Um, during that time, once my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, I was, it was kind of like this bottleneck uh, process where I was finding uh, the depression of alcohol overwhelming. Um, the habit had grown throughout my life of something that I just always did and had, a, had accumulated to a point where I was getting pretty much drunk every you know, three to four times a week, which is a lot. And then the depression between the times of drinking was near suicidal and just I couldn't accomplish anything. And once my father was diagnosed, I hit a point where uh, I knew there wasn't a lot of time left when he got diagnosed. It was stage four dementia. Uh, that literally means you're told the worst news of your entire life that you're going to die of Alzheimer's. And then 30 minutes later, you don't remember. And there's, there's no, there's no fixing it. There's no cure. So it's a death sentence. Um, and I did not want to not be present, if that makes sense. Like we're all gonna die and hopefully it doesn't suck that bad. Uh, and this was my father's death and I wanted to be there for him as much as I could. So I needed to man up and stop drinking. Um, 
I did not expect it to be as positive an experience as it was. It was difficult for a couple of months. And honestly, at that point, COVID kind of helped because I was isolating and not going out to all those events. So by the time I did end up going out to dinners or so forth later on, I was already comfortable drinking soda water and answering those questions. Oh, you're not drinking type of thing. Um, like I said, I'm three years into it now and it's, it's an, it's fantastic in, in, in a way that is hard for other people to understand. And I don't mean that like, um, I found Jesus, I found uh, uh, Muhammad, I found whatever religious idea, uh, being you believe in. Uh, it's not that. It, it's the fact that it's a compound interest. So when you go to the gym, if you go to the gym today and you work out really hard, you're not going to look good tomorrow. It's not going to change anything. If you go to the gym every day for 45 minutes for the next week, you're not going to change anything. If you do that for a month, you will. If you do that for six months, you're going to look freaking awesome. And all your friends will like, holy crap, you look amazing. And you will be stronger. And you will feel sexy. And you will feel confident. Um, the same thing happens with your brain. When you stop doping it with chemicals that create depression, it builds up its own dopamine, serotonin, melatonin, all the happy joy juice that you need buzzing through your head. So in the beginning, it's hard because it doesn't happen. And you start taking all the vitamins that help replace it and start being very focused on where your mind's going realizing that it's not actually you. There's a difference between the thoughts that come into your head and the you that is you watching those thoughts come into your head. You don't need to believe in any spirituality or religion to fathom that. You're having a conversation in your head right now and you can witness it and the witness is you. So as you slowly build up your resources in your brain again, uh, the level of constant Happiness and joy is shockingly wonderful. And I don't mean you're running through fields of tulips like some Disney animated anime character, but I mean, you just get to smile without sadness behind your eyes all the time because life is freaking great. And you did all that when you were a kid. You didn't need to drink. So it, it's... I look at the process now and I, I have some friends who are dealing with rough times and, and dealing with depression. And I try to give them as much support as I can. I'm not a therapist. I have no qualifications to give anybody advice except I love them and I want them to be happy. Um, but I, I do look at it like it's a bio computer for me to hack and most importantly, be responsible for. When it, really came, when, it really, when it really came to making the decision to quit drinking and you were saying that your father got um, Alzheimer's and you knew that it was going to be, you know, really painful. What was that moment like when you really decided you're going to quit drinking and really focus and do better for your mental health? It, it kind of builds up on you. It's not like uh, pulling a Band-Aid off. And, and revealing your decision. It's more like picking at the scab where you keep on going, eh, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to be drunk and depressed anymore. It's not fun. And when I drink, it's not fun. I'm just, and I know that what's going to come sucks and I'm picking at the scab and I just don't want it. I don't want to face the reality of the solution is really simple. Just put the bottle down. And I think one of the biggest things, honestly, is the reason it's so intimidating is because people talk about it like it's impossible. I think if they change the conversation and said, dude, people do it all the time. You do it every single day when you go to bed and you don't wake up two hours later get, to get drunk again. You did it your entire life before you were a young enough adult that you wanted to drink. 
uh, people who um, get on a plane and don't have a drink, people who are in the military for 12 weeks. You know, like it happens all the time. It's not impossible. It's a, it's a matrix of belief that's um, institutionalized by the companies that are selling the liquor. It's bullshit. It's bullshit. That's all. So if you have a support team and, and look, um, I go to AA meetings and I just started them in November, December of last year. You know, you can do whatever works for you. Find somebody who supports you and go on a, on a walk, get, get creative, get happy, get productive. Don't uh, think of it as, uh, oh, it's so hard. It's not, dude. It really, it really isn't. It just takes a little time to rewire your brain. That's it. If you look at it through that light and attack it like a job uh, that has massive benefits because you want to be happier, it works. And you're talking about the support of your friends. Were there any other factors that they have depression too you were talking about? What is that support system like both ways? You let people talk. You listen to their process. Uh, my, you know, my wife and I, um, if she needs to vent about something, obviously she does. Um, if I'm go, if I was going through something that was challenging, uh, one of the tricks I found that was really good was addressing it out loud, uh, sitting down and internalizing it the entire time gave it too much, uh, power. Um, saying it out loud made it a small thing that was easily overcome. So uh, one of the tricks I would use was I would look in the mirror and I would say, I'm feeling this, I want this, but what do I, what do I really want? And how long am I gonna really want this? Let's just take two minutes and let's just stay here for two minutes. Staring at yourself in the mirror, knowing that the only person who's there is you and yet there's this, like, there's this addiction that's trying to mess with you to get you to fall back into a process that gives you absolutely nothing, like nothing, dude. So really challenging that conversation face-to-face -face into a mirror and, and voicing it out loud, it gets so small and petty and easy to go, no, I don't want to do that. I want to be the person who does it. I want... I want my future more than I want what you're offering me. And that was the act of choice. So what I'm supporting my friends uh, and, and when they're going through divorces or depression or midlife crisis, it, the goal is to hear what they're saying, listen to them, but at the same time, discuss low hanging fruit of options. Like number one, put the bottle down. Get off your ass, go for a walk. You will feel better. It is scientifically proven that you will kick off your dopamine if you just go for a 10 minute walk. So start upping your dopamine naturally. Eat more fish, little crap like that. Take melatonin, sleep better, uh, change your diet. Little things that, and you know this, everybody loves to go to the gym for the first week because they, they buy the new fancy outfit or the fan, the cool shoes and they're all excited about how good they look like a, an X-Men in the mirror or whatever. Um, so it's fun. It's fun to buy the crap that you then use to make your brain balance. So that's easy, low-hanging fruit to motivate people to try. And then they get wrapped up in that conversation. So they can only do it themselves, but you can hopefully hold their hand a little bit. The, the loss of your father, knowing that you had actually given up drinking so that you were present for him, how did that sort of affect you once he passed? It, it, was, a, it was a big one. Um, I was so grateful that I was present. And, and let me put it this way. like I was in Toronto, Canada, where I'm from. I was visiting my mom and my older brother, and I was in my mom's, uh, my mom's house. And I got a text from my sister um, that my dad had passed. And 
it was pretty, I mean, that's very abrupt. And I, I wanted her to tell me in the quickest way possible, not call me up and be like, Hey, by the way, cause she was in a full, a full care mental facility at that point, he was on morphine. Uh, we knew that there was only X amount of time left. I was not able to go back to see him find uh, the final, uh, final step of his life. Um, he wouldn't know who I was at that point. Um, and he was, he was not incubated, but he would st had stopped eating for quite a while. So he was very thin and sick. Um, so I find out my father had died and I'm with my mom. And so I tell her, and they had been divorced since pretty much my entire life. So that's it, their relationship was not like a huge loss for her, but she was sad for my dad. And she asked me if I was okay. I'm like, yeah. Um, I'm going to go to my hotel room. I just want to be by myself right now. I didn't want to drink. I didn't want to smoke weed or smoke cigarettes or anything. I didn't want to do anything that would mute the emotion that was experience that was happening because I wanted to honor my father's life, sorry if I get teary, and his death, honestly. And I felt safe that, look, however I feel, whether I'm sad or I'm angry, um, that's okay. That's part of life. It's safe. I'm not going to cry so much that I explode or scream so much that my arm falls off. It's safe. These emotions aren't going to hurt me so I want to experience them let them wash over me and out of me and knowing that like they come in waves you know it hasn't been that long I talked to my dad the other day in the car as I'm driving and I'm like I miss you it makes me sad but that's okay to be sad I was really I was really grateful that I got to uh, be present at that moment as opposed to hiding in an alcohol haze that you know years later you'd regret that you were such a coward that you hid away from the moment when really this is life and it's short and i'm incredibly blessed and grateful to be here and all of it is a gift i know that sounds cheesy as hell but i'm trying to look at it that way I think a lot of people can relate to addiction and loss and the experiences that you have and you're able now to sh express your emotions but that can be really um, like hard to just yeah. to, to express how you're feeling and to have people to express them too what would you say to those people don't be afraid don't be afraid uh, like i said earlier honestly talking into the mirror staring into your own eyes and having a conversation you, it really helped. I know it sounds stupid. Like I call, I found it easier for me. And, and I'm, to me, I'm not a nice person. So when I had been drinking a lot, it put me, it, it made me chubby. And then I would, you know, I quit drinking and then I get out of the shower. I'd look in the mirror and be like, ah, I'm still chubby. And my answer to that was look in the mirror and go, okay, fat boy, you drank for years to get fat. You, you were chugging alcohol with no thought of the process, like an idiot, and you expect that you're going to lose the weight. You fat little bitch. You need to shut your mouth and just do your job. And so I, <laughs> I did this thing where I would not look at myself with my shirt off for the first month and a half. Because at the end of a month and a half, I was like, oh, hey, I lost that. That looks better. So I will call myself a fat little bitch. I would not call anybody else a fat little bitch. That's not my judgment to make. But when I had those conversations in the mirror, eh, I called myself on, on the BS that I was putting out there. And it made me laugh. And it gave me a job to do. And then I sort of self-directed. And it sounds like you've touched on this a little bit, but for people who are listening and just looking for advice as well, how have you been able to continue to build resilience? 
Um, finding people that I respect and asking for their help and guidance. Uh, being open about the conversation. I, look, I didn't want and I have not made being sober my identity. That's not what I wanted to do. Um, and I respect anybody's process. They go another way. I know some people, a friend of mine the other day said, uh, explained addiction, whether it be alcohol or drugs, like uh, it's like being on an elevator. Come on. Come on. Get out. Come on. Sorry, my cat. Yeah. Um, explain, it, described it as being on an elevator. And, you know, some people get off on a higher floor and it's not the view is still pretty good and then some people go all the way to the basement and it's really dark and i feel like i got fortunate enough to get off on a higher floor um so i didn't really see it as my identity uh, i just posted about my three-year sobriety uh yesterday and i had never mentioned it ever before over the last three years not publicly at all um i looked to the people that I respected. I hung out with people that liked to not drink, who were inspired and, and excited about other things besides drinking or drugs, um, just because it made it easy and fun. So whatever turns you on when it comes to the things you like to talk about, um, I work in visual effects and, and, and post on sound and color and filmmaking. So talking to friends of mine about Unreal Engine and uh, the, new, the new type of computer processing pro uh, uh, powers and, and the type of uh, 3D uh, camera tracking, not going to be exciting for everybody else, but for me, that's something that I can spend hours listening to someone discuss. So I, I just searched out people who I respected and enjoyed their company who are enthusiastic about a world outside of alcohol and drinking. Some of it was physical fitness. Some of it was more mental and or computer oriented or writing oriented. And then I just sort of align myself with them, if that makes sense. It, mental health is so prevalent. It's statistically over 20% of the population. And from your experience, can you speak to why you think that is? Why it's so prevalent with all the conversations that are out there supporting therapy and getting help and it's okay to be not be okay? I, I think it's uh, systemic. When I was a kid, there was the, uh, the food pyramid. And uh, your viewers may not remember this, but maybe you can find an image of it and throw it up there. And it, it was basically a pyramid of what you should eat, the top, down, then da, 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 like that. And if you look at it now, you're going to laugh because it's for breakfast, you should have a bagel and cereal and some bread and some more pancakes and waffles and orange juice, like it was just sugar, 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 and carbs, and sugar, and carbs, and sugar, and carbs. And then you find out years later that that was because they were, uh, the government was, um, what's the proper term, sponsoring the wheat farmers of America. There's a proper language for that. Uh, they were financing them. Anyhow, um, so there was an agenda to have people eat garbage in order to maintain the economy um to benefit the economy but the the damage that it did to the people was ridiculous and you know it sounds look if you drive your car and you put and it's a gas car and you put diesel fuel in it you'll ruin the engine it, it matters what you put in the tank and I think when you start treating children and people like what they eat doesn't matter and then wonder why they're so cranky and overwrought, you're, you're creating the problem yourself. So I, I think you have to look at the entire system, not just, well, people are sad. That's not how science works. You go, you look at it and think there's a, People are overwhelmed and people are dealing with mental health issues. 
what age are they? How, how long has this been going on? How long was it not spoken about? What are the uh, what are the factors in society and culture and nature and diet and uh, living uh, environments and work environment and communication environments that are impacting people? And that's a lot of stuff, right? But um, I think there's a lot of factors going on that uh, that cause this sense of being overwhelmed. And I'm hoping that people start looking at it like something that they can affect. Um, you know, I, and I'm not a scientist, but my understanding of like a double blind test is you give people the um, the actual drug and the, what's the word for the other one, the fake one, the- uh, Placebo? The, the, placebo, yeah, thank you. And you give them placebo. So you're really trying to figure out what is having the impact. And in my own life, what I was doing was removing everything and then starting with stuff that I know worked. So uh, if I wanted, to, I knew putting down the bottle and having soda water gave my, gave my throat that burning texture like a drink did, but I had no alcohol. Cool. And then I knew I wanted to be satiated. And I know that fats do that. So I'd have salads with lots of avocado and I get macadamia nuts or whatever. So I indulge on the good things and I slowly, I keep everything else out so I could basically test what was helping me. If that makes sense. Yeah. It just sounds like working on your mental health from the inside out, taking care of your yeah. body. Thank you. That's a better way to say all the stuff that I just <laughs> I try to work on it from the inside out. Yeah. So people look at you and they think they know you. They've grown up seeing your films. What do they get wrong about you? I don't know. Uh, I'm only 5'10". So sometimes they'll be like, you look bigger in the movie. I'm like, no, I'm only 5'10". Um, let's see. Um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a nice person. My wife thinks I'm a nice person. As a bully, uh, they... I'm not, but that was the job. I don't know. Uh, people seem to know me a little well. I kind of, I've kind of been around now for 45 years. So uh, uh, I know I've got kind of a punchable face. I've kind of got the evil the evil guy face, but um, I comedy and, and making people laugh is one of my favorite things. And for people that are watching that are seeing hope, in your story and where you are today, what would you say to them to give them hope? Start small, make it simple. Um, you know, it's just like going to the gym when people are thinking they're gonna go lift massive weights. Don't, you're just gonna hurt yourself, it's gonna suck. So start simple, go for a walk. Start simple. Start simple, go for a walk, eat yummy, fruits and veg stuff that makes you feel good like uh put coconut milk in, uh, coconut oil in your coffee it'll make you feel fat and happy without being fat and fat but you'll be happy it'll make your brain work um sleep well turn off the lights in your room when you go to bed don't scrub your phone try and read a book slightly just give it a shot and when you know you don't want to do it because that other part of your brain is like come on just 20 more minutes of Instagram as I lie in bed, say it out loud. And then write, like just decide, what do you want more? Um, it was funny. So I, I was in Bulgaria and I shot um, A Christmas Story Christmas. And I was there for two, two months and I had rented a PS5 and I was trying to learn how to play Spider-Man and some other games. And I just had a thought, I was like, do I want to be the guy who goes away from his wife for two months and then comes back and he's good at Spider-Man? Or do I want to be the guy who went to the gym every day? Like, I did not want to go to the gym, but I wanted to be the guy who went. Does that make sense? Yeah. It was only two months. It was just two months. And all I had to do, I was very fortunate because it was in the hotel we were at. It was a little crappy gym. There's no one else who went to it. So for 45 minutes a day, I went down and I lifted things and I made sure I didn't hurt myself because I don't want to hurt myself. 
No, you the old me. So it was the, that goal. And then when I came back from Bulgaria, I had, it was huge. My wife was like, you look like Captain America. And it was a great uh -huh. feeling to have accomplished something that other people were like, oh, you can't possibly do. And I just took little bites. I just took little tiny bites at my goal, knowing that it wasn't going to happen overnight. And I think if you look at it like that, again, it's compound interest and you can pretty much accomplish anything. Thank you so much for your time. I'm just going to ask you one more question. Sure. I think the audience would probably like to know as well, but if there's anything that people can take away from your story, what is that? You already have it. You can do it. It's inside you. Just choose. But the first, the first step is just to choose you. Choose who you want to be and realize you already are that. I think that's really good advice. Thank you so much, Zach, for your time. I really appreciate it. I just want to thank everyone who's watching online on social media. If you guys are leaving messages in the comments, I'm there to join you. And thank you again for just being so open and vulnerable to a subject that is not really easy to talk about. So thank you again.